Hey there, welcome back to another Make Science Easy Physics lesson. In this lesson, we're going to be learning all about the topic of friction. We're going to be finding out what friction is and which different factors affect the rate of friction. We're also going to be finding out why friction can either be a very useful force or a very unhelpful force. So, the first thing that we really need to know is what is friction? Well, friction is basically a contact force, which means two objects are touching each other, and it occurs any time the objects are touching each other and try to move past each other or try to slide past each other. So, if you take your hands and you put them together and you rub your hands, you will feel friction between your hands as you rub them. So you'll feel your hands working against each other. This is the force of friction. Now, as you rub your hands, you'll notice that your hands start to rub up. And if you rub your hands really, really hard or really, really fast, you'll notice there is more friction and your hands start to get warm. And this is because of friction and because there is energy involved. So, friction from moving objects always causes some heating. So, whenever two objects rub past each other, some of that kinetic energy from the movement is converted into thermal energy. Also, the faster the objects move, the more friction there's going to be, so the more heating there's going to be. And obviously, as we've already said, the more friction there is, the more warming there is between the surfaces that are rubbing together. So, friction makes it harder for objects to slide past each other. As we've already said, it's a contact force. As two objects are touching each other and they move past each other, there is friction. The friction is working against the movement. It's making movement difficult. But sometimes friction can be helpful, it can be desirable, and at other times friction can be undesirable, something that we do not want, and it really just depends on the circumstances. So let's have a look at what we call dynamic and static friction. So here we've got a spring, and it is attached to a mass, a weight, and it's quite a large mass, it doesn't really matter what it is, and this weight is against a wooden surface. Now, we can apply a force of 5 newtons to that spring. So we're pulling on that spring with a force of 5 newtons. Now, because that force is being applied to the spring, it's also being applied to the block. But the block is not moving. So as we pull on the spring and the block with a force of 5 newtons, there is no movement. So a reactionary force in the opposite direction of equal magnitude will also appear. Remember, forces act in opposite directions, and if things are in equilibrium, that means that there's no movement or no change of speed, then those forces must be balanced. So here, we have a force being applied. There is no movement. We have equilibrium. So an equal and opposite force is applied as well. So the overall resultant force on this block is zero newtons. With five newtons pulling in each direction, they cancel each other out, so the block does not move. It is stationary. Now, we call this static friction because friction is still taking place. There's still friction between the block and the table, but the force applied is not enough to overcome this friction. So there is friction, but there is no movement, so we call this static friction. Now, when we have static friction, when there's no movement, there's also no heat generated because the objects are not sliding past each other. Now, if we apply a little bit more force to our block, so we apply 6 newtons to the spring, if the block does not move, that means we still have static friction, and in the opposite direction, we'll have an equal force in an opposite direction. So we have an overall resultant force still of zero newtons because we do not have enough force to overcome the static friction between the block and the wooden surface. 
eventually, if we apply enough force, we're going to be applying more force than the static friction also provides. So, if we apply 7 newtons to our spring, that might be greater than the static friction. That means the force applied to the block can move that block because it's greater than the force of friction. So the block will move because we do not have balanced forces anymore. So as the block moves and as we have movement, we have dynamic friction. And dynamic friction occurs when two objects are sliding past each other. And we get dynamic friction whenever force acting in one direction is greater than the force acting in the other direction, so we have movement. Now, the resultant force in this case is going to be 2 newtons to the right. Now, this is a smaller force than the force that is being applied by static friction. So, dynamic friction is going to generally be smaller than static friction. And whenever we have dynamic friction, we're going to have heating. This is because energy is transferred from the movement to the objects as they slide past each other. So friction causes this transfer of energy. So let's have a look at some examples of useful friction. So we know that friction can be useful. And friction, for example, between the ground and our shoes is going to stop us falling over. Imagine that we have no friction between our shoes and the ground will fall over. It's a bit like stepping on ice. If you step on ice and you don't realize you're stepping on ice, you will slip because there's less friction. So friction between our shoes and the ground is useful. So if you stand on ice, for example, you're going to end up slipping because there's not much friction. So friction between the ground and our feet is useful. We also need friction to hold on to things. If you want to pick things up with your hands, you need a force of friction between your hands and the object you're holding. If you have wet hands or slippery hands, you try to pick something up, it's much harder because there's less friction. So in this case, friction is useful. So if we think about a climber climbing up rocks, you'll notice that climbers put chalk on their hands. This both absorbs moisture from their sweat, but it also helps to create a rougher surface. This provides more friction between their hands and the rock. This means they can hold onto the rock much more easily. The brakes on our cars also need friction to help slow the car down. So we have a rough surface where our brake pad is, and we have a rough surface where our brake caliper is, and these push against each other, and these create friction to slow the car down. If there was no friction and we applied the brakes, the wheel would keep on spinning and we would not slow down. So friction can be useful in the correct circumstances. However, friction can also be an unwanted force. There are times when we do not actually want to have any friction. So not all friction is going to be desirable. So we've mentioned that cars need friction between their brakes in order to slow them down, but we also in other parts of the car want to reduce friction. And in the body of the car, we want it to be as streamlined as possible because as a car moves through the air, there is friction between the car and the air. The more friction there is, the slower the car will be. So we make sure our car is streamlined to make sure the air flowing around our car has as little friction as possible with that car. We make it streamlined. If we look, for example, at a lorry, it's obviously less important that it goes quickly. So it is slightly less streamlined. And this means there is greater friction between the lorry and the air than there would be between the car and the air. The problem of this is, if you have more friction, you need to use more energy to travel just as far, meaning you're going to burn more fuel, which will create more pollution and cost more money to run. Friction is also going to be undesirable with things such as moving parts and engines. If you think about it, if we have lots of friction in the engine, the moving parts of the engine are going to wear down and they're going to break.
because as things rub together, they start to damage each other. So too much friction in an engine will damage it. Also, if you have too much friction, the temperature of the engine is going to get very, very high. If we have a high temperature in the engine, we're going to damage that engine again. It's going to overheat. It's not going to work properly. So there are many, many cases where friction is an undesirable force and we want to reduce it. So, if we want to think about how we reduce friction, we need to think about something called lubricants. Rough surfaces create more friction than smooth surfaces. So the rougher a surface is, the more friction there is as those surfaces rub together. So we can see here at the top, we've got a fairly smooth surface, and at the bottom, we have a fairly rough surface. If we move these surfaces past each other, there's going to be friction between both, but the smooth surface is going to have much lower friction than the rough surface. Now, obviously, high friction may be desirable or may be undesirable, but if high friction is undesirable, we need to reduce the amount of friction. In order to reduce the amount of friction, we add liquids known as lubricants to the surface. Now, lubricants are things such as oil and they're very slippery. And so if we add a lubricant to a surface, it will reduce the amount of surface. It will make those surfaces slide past each other. A really simple way of thinking about this, you've already rubbed your hands together. As you rubbed your hand together, there was quite a lot of friction. Once you've finished watching this video, go wash your hands. Get soap all over your hands. But instead of rinsing your hands off, rub your hands together. You'll notice, of course, your hands are much more slippery. There's much less friction. The soap acts as a lubricant. It reduces the amount of friction between the surfaces. So not only will there be less friction, but there'll be less heating as well. So lubricants reduce the amount of friction between surfaces. And lubricants include things such as oil, and oils are the most common lubricants used in industry. So it's also important to mention, as there's less friction, there's obviously going to be less damage and less heating is going to take place. This is obviously going to be, in many situations, a good thing. So, in summary, friction occurs as surfaces slide past each other. The greater the friction, the harder it is for those objects to slide past each other. Friction from sliding causes heating. If friction is strong enough to prevent movement, we call it static friction. If we have movement of objects when there is friction applied, we call this dynamic friction. Friction can help us grip things, which makes it very useful at times. However, air resistance is a friction between a moving object and the air. This can be undesirable. Or if you have engines or machinery or moving parts, friction is generally undesirable because the friction makes the machinery inefficient and it causes it to become damaged. So we can use lubricants such as oil to reduce friction when that friction is undesirable. So I hope you now know a little bit more about friction. I hope you understand what friction is and why it can be important or undesirable in some cases. Until next lesson, Keep on learning.